Hello, my name is Karen Nelson. I'm Dean of the School of Architecture at the BAC. We have been recognized with distinction for our leadership role in educating an extraordinarily diverse student body to help bring about social equity through design. We do this through the design of landscapes, of historic architecture, of interior architecture, of designs for human health, and more. This spring, we're hosting a range of events to complement our original exhibit in McCormick Gallery, Architectures Within Us, Selected Works from Balkrishna Doshi. Welcome to the third event of the Spring 2023 Lecture Series, Just Environments. Catherine Larson is with us. Uh, she's originally from New Jersey, and she's now based in both Copenhagen and the Netherlands. She works as an architectural technologist and an architect who specializes in natural constructions. She's the founder of Kath Studio Catherine Larson, and she's known for her innovative work with biodesign, especially with marine materials, which is how she came to our attention. In fact, a thesis student of ours was becoming obsessed with her. And so we invited her to join us this spring because of a thesis student's interest last December. Catherine combines material science with vernacular construction techniques to come up with new applications for the building industry. Please give a warm welcome to architect Catherine Larson as she gives her lecture, Designing with the Sea, Marine Biomaterials in Architecture. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, I would like to say a um, big thank you to David for helping facilitate and arrange this. Also with Karen, um, I really appreciate being able to be here and to lecture to you all. Um, I'm going to start off my talk today, not by talking about biomaterials, which is something I usually do, but actually by talking a little bit about my journey as a designer and some of the early influences I had that really shaped my career. So when I was 10, my parents bought a very old Victorian house in New Jersey. Um, and then proceeded to spend the next six years of my life fixing it up. So I actually grew up in a very active building site in a house that was listed and seeing all of the drama of trying to renovate a listed house in New Jersey up close and personal. One of the crazy things about this house was that when we moved in, there was no insulation. So the first couple of winters were very, very cold 20 degree weather and we were all huddled up sleeping in sleeping bags, moving from floor to floor on air mattresses. Um, so having this experience of renovating a very old house and getting to see you know, that the original plans and drawings are actually in the public library and all these books about the architect Samuel Sloan, all these things really shaped me as a architect to be and to see this interaction of people on site and things going from idea to sketch to drawing to actually being built was something that really inspired me. And what ins inspired me most of all was the communication that happens between disciplines. The communication that happens between the architect and the contractor, the client and the architect. And my mother who had studied architecture played an integral role in designing parts of the house alongside the architect. So this was a big inspiration to me and definitely is one of the things that influenced me going forward and looking to study architecture. The other thing that had a very big early influence on me was the fact that my high school had a sister school in Kaskabe in Japan. And I spent my early summers uh, from age 14 onwards studying Japanese and falling in love with the language and getting to visit Japan and see this very old technique of craft and tradition and buildings. And one of the things for me that was most inspirational was how um, today in Japan, architects are still drawing on this tradition to build buildings today. So while as of you know, hundreds of years ago, they might have engineered all the joints by hand using tools, and some of them still do this today for temples and shrines. Um, some of the newer buildings might use uh, CNC milling to come up with complex joints that are then hammered into place on site. So seeing this process and seeing this inspiration over time uh, come through in modern architecture was something that I found very, very inspirational. This is probably how I expected my journey as a architect to go when I first started. I thought it was going to be a very linear journey. I had been admitted to Cornell University and I thought, oh, you know, I'll do my five-year BR, you know, 
I'll go do the AREs, you know, I'll do my internship, I'll get all those checks done, and then finally you can call me an architect. Well, this is actually what my journey ended up looking like. It was all over the place. Um, I was limited by how expensive school was, which was a big shock to me, um, thinking, okay, I, I can't exactly afford to go $300,000 in debt for a BARC. Uh-oh, what do I do? Um, I ended up going to Europe where I started studying architectural technology and which was a cheaper education, but also set me up to work really well in the industry from a year onwards. Um, a very practical education that focused on construction management and, you know, designing all sorts of construction details. Uh, but then the reality was in Denmark, then I was limited and told um, you're not a designer and you shouldn't think you're a designer because you didn't attend design school. So stay in your lane and don't design. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't very good at listening to that and I uh, ended up doing my master's degree in architecture at TU Delft. Along the way, along my journey, I ended up being able to travel to lots of different places and using my sketchbook as a tool to continue studying architecture when I was outside of the school system. And using drawing as a tool to teach myself more and more about what I was seeing and what I was observing ended up becoming very integral in my design process later on. So over the last decade, I've created yeah, at least 10 different sketchbooks of all the places I've been, even normal mundane things like trash cans and, you know, food or things that I experienced that were new or observations I made, I wrote them all down and drew them up. Um, and, and I think becoming an architect, it's about training your skills of observation and noticing things, whether that's how people move through a space or perhaps the facades and the paints that were used or all these different little details, they all can become an influence in how we see design and interact with it. And of course, because my experience through the education system was so nonlinear and so unexpected, I realized that I have an important perspective and there's a way I can use my voice as an architect to create a platform. So one of the things that I've been doing lately is drawing attention to some of the blind spots in academia and writing about that um, I had an article that was published with Het New Institute, which is a Dutch uh, institution, art institution, where I interviewed first generation students who wanted to remain anonymous about what their experiences were like trying to go through architecture school. And I also recently contributed a little graphic novel style uh, article to the first building uh, diversity publication here in Denmark about some of the things I faced as barriers of entry to becoming an architect and trying to draw awareness to the fact that we need more voices in architecture and we need more diverse perspectives. Um, so with that, I will talk a little bit more about what I'm actually known for, which happens to be using biomaterials and design. And one of the things that really uh, is a driving force behind my practice is the fact that 3.5 billion years ago, life as we knew it actually began in the ocean. But very unfortunately, climate scientists are currently predicting that in as little as 30 years, life as we know it could actually end in the ocean. So it's with this urgency that um, I created my practice, I created my business, and we're kind of going full force trying to do what we can to mitigate hopefully some of this damage. And one of the keys that I think uh, could be to improving things is actually to take inspiration from the ocean and the species that are in it. Now, I take a very uh, Bauhausian approach to architecture. Um, I see architecture in all things, and perhaps that's because of my nonlinear education path. One of the things that I see architecture in is the ability to look at materials and to start to construct things from the ground up. If we look at the building in itself as a, a design of elements, Perhaps the most extreme form of design is to actually start at the material level and then construct our way up from that level. And when we start at a material level, there's so much more control we can start to have on things, especially when we consider it from the design process beginning instead of at the end. Um, so in a traditional architecture design process, we tend to think about the site conditions for first and foremost. And from there, you know, our building form comes and it shapes according to the site, we might face it due east or due west. Um, and then eventually our interior and programming evolves to fit the function uh, of what our building needs to be. 
And then perhaps at the very end or perhaps midway through, we start to think about the materials we want to do to achieve this. Um, my practice really follows what is known as a material driven design process where I always start thinking very early on about the materials and the different types of construction techniques I want to use. And then I have this interdependent relationship between how those materials are actually expressed in the form and how that comes to impact the interior, the site. And you know, I try to use materials always that are local, that can be easily obtained, and that always plays a role in my design process as well. So I end up with this interdependent, sorry, interconnected uh, relationship between materiality and architecture. I end up working a lot with seagrass. Um, one of the things that people always ask me is what is the difference between seagrass and seaweed? Uh, the key difference is that seagrass is a plant. It has a root system. And by the way, today is World Seagrass Day. So happy World Seagrass Day. Uh, but seaweed is a little bit different. It has a holdfast, uh, which is kind of like a little spongy foot, like a barnacle, and that allows it to basically grow on rocks, um, whereas seagrass needs to be in the seabed rooted. Uh, so while seaweed can grow on ropes, seagrass needs to grow in the seabed. And this is a pretty fundamental difference. I'll probably get to it a little bit later on in my, in my talk, but also for construction purposes, because while seagrass makes a wonderful form of natural insulation, uh, seaweed has a tendency to rot in wall cavities. So making a distinction between different species, different types of you know, materials is actually very important when it comes to using them in natural constructions. So this sometimes leads to investigative work for me because I need to figure out uh, historically if a text is actually referring to seaweed or seagrass. So this very old article from 1929 is talking about walls being lined with seaweed quilts. And what this article is actually describing is a very old product known as Cabot's quilt, which was a very primitive form of insulation here also in the U.S. Um, seagrass was sewn in between two pieces of cardboard paper, and this was used to insulate walls. So one of the keys to know here is that the long green ribbons of sea plants that are being described actually refers to Zostera marina, not to seaweed. And it can get kind of confusing because a lot of old texts will refer to seagrass as seaweed because we didn't necessarily know the difference. We weren't all you know, with Google in our pockets knowing the difference between seagrass and seaweed. Uh, but it's important to note this and important to note this difference uh, because it does have an impact on construction. So this is a photo here of Cabot's quilt. And one of the things people always ask me, you know, okay, um, you know, we have mineral wool today that can last, you know, 40 to 80 years. How long can your seagrass last? Uh, it can last hundreds of years preserved in a wall cavity. Um, so that is also too why it was an especially effective insulation choice over history and was used around the world as an insulation choice. Uh, for me, the reason why I love seagrass so much perhaps is because when I came into contact with it in Denmark, um, I came into contact with it being thatched on roofs here. And this is what absolutely made me fall in love with construction. Um, I wanted to know, you know, how do you work with this material and how, how do you thatch with seagrass? I'd never heard of it before. Uh, so I really went down on this deep dive in this rabbit hole. Um, it actually ended up being that it was women's work to thatch these roofs on Lesu, which is incredible. We tend to think of construction, you know, as this very male dominated industry, um, but it was the women's role to collect the seagrass and to process it. Uh, which they would do every uh, autumn after it washed up from storms. And they would leave it on a field to be dried and rained on for about six months. And then in spring, construction could begin on a new roof. So two to three women would grab, gather up the seagrass from the fields and begin twisting them into large ropes known as fast. And then these ropes would be woven around the bottom rafters. Pine branches would be placed on top and then more seagrass would be piled on top. And very importantly, actually, the women would then dance on the roof uh, to compress the roof together. Um, so one of the key points that I found when studying seagrass and construction is actually to have this element of compression in the roof, either from the self-weight of the seagrass that is used or by us dancing on it. So today the tradition in Denmark is having a revival. 
Um, this is Kurt from Munsang. Uh, he gathers up the seagrass still like in the old days. He puts it on a field and leaves it on there for only a week. It just needs to be rained on and dried and then he processes it into bales. Uh, and that red thing is actually a hundred year old seagrass bale presser that he has in his farm. And uh, he also is responsible for shipping the majority of seagrass over to Leisu so that they can continue to preserve the roofs and the traditions. So um, in my practice early on, I began experimenting with thatching the seagrass in different constructions. Um, I wanted to know if there was a way that we could you know, improve the construction process to make it more accessible for uh, modern buildings. So I built a series of very public testing pavilions in Copenhagen, testing out different thatch panels and thatch variations using the seagrass in construction. Um, and my goal was also to get people to interact with the material because people tend to think of seagrass as something slimy or smelly, but actually when it's processed, it doesn't smell at all. It kind of smells like very salty hay. Um, so I wanted people to take a seat underneath the seagrass, experience the seagrass, um, and come into contact with this material and perhaps confront some of their prejudices regarding it. Um, so this was the pavilion we built in Copenhagen in 2019. Both my uh, testing pavilions that I built over time failed, but for different reasons. Uh, the first testing pavilion I built in 2018 failed because there was no construction air gap behind the seagrass. So eventually rotted and disintegrated. And then unfortunately with this uh, pavilion, the seagrass flew away because I didn't have enough tension and uh, compression in the construction. Um, I ended up finding another old, very, very uh, non-written about technique from Moon actually, where they weave a twig through the construction and press that down to add more compression. So that is something I would like to try in the future to improve the construction uh, of my thatching panels. And I think that having this knowledge and this experience of failure is something very important to write about. Perhaps we as architects, we like to hide the fact that we fail things, uh, but actually uh, when it comes to very old construction techniques, um, things are done in a certain way for certain reasons uh, through trial and error over hundreds of years. So coming up with these uh, you know, failure moments becomes an important data set for other architects to learn from. So I published it in the rumor article uh, for bio-based building. Uh, so that others can learn from these mistakes and perhaps improve their own seagrass constructions. So if seagrass is so great and so cool and it's great as an insulation material, why don't we use seagrass today? Why, why don't we hear about this? You know, Because this is a natural material. Um, it could be carbon negative in some circumstances because it can absorb more CO2 than uh, it actually produces when you use it in construction. So great material, why aren't we using it? Um, well, unfortunately, this is why. This is the eelgrass bed situation in Denmark around 1900, and this is it by 1994. So eelgrass and seagrass in general is, because it's in the seabed, it is severely threatened by human activity, um, especially by nutrient loading. It makes it very difficult for the seagrass to plant, to root, um, and then once it starts to disappear, you start to have a catastrophic collapse of the seagrass. Um, now that being said, you know, one of the things people always ask me is, you know, is there enough seagrass for us to actually work with? And my answer is always, it depends, you know, here in Denmark, there's so much that washes up that there are literally mountains of seagrass. It's the same circumstance in also Northern Germany and also in Sweden. So there is enough seagrass for us to work with that we should be using because it ends up being buried in landfills. So here I am with Kurt and he's showing me a gigantic mountain of seagrass and he's also explaining to me the difference between some of the seaweeds that are on the beach and the seagrass. Um, so I think definitely in Denmark there's enough for construction that we ought to be using it. Um, it's just it's a site specific situation where we should only really be using it where it washes up as a material. And one of the things I got to do this summer was actually meet up with a bunch of um, marine biologists and conservationists with seagrass and help uh, learn more about the conservation side of things and how much it takes to plant seagrass. Um, it takes wearing a bunch of weights strapped to your trash chest and then diving down three meters and manually planting a uh, seagrass plant that is attached to a nail into the seabed and then planting basically a whole field of a hundred of those so that they protect each other in the sea. 
Um, so this is basically what it takes to bring back seagrass when it starts to go away. It's super labor intensive. And it's one of the reasons why we need to work on preserving it. Um, seagrass is an excellent um, litmus test for the health of the, of the ocean. And basically, if it's growing really well, it means that the water has good clarity, the water is healthy, it doesn't have a lot of turbidity, it roots the whole seabed together. Uh, so if you're missing seagrass, your ocean's probably not doing so great. So we really need to protect our seagrass because if we don't, that's really, really hard to bring it back, unfortunately. So happy World Seagrass Day. Um, seagrass is super important for us. So after I started doing all this work with seagrass and traditional seagrass construction, one of the things that I got asked a lot by seaweed farmers was, if you can do all this with seagrass, what can you do with seaweed? And of course, everyone's interested always in the carbon sequestration potential of seaweed. Like, can we just grow a bunch of it and just shove it in a building and forget about it? Um, <laughs> so I have, probably have a lot of people who come and ask me this probably once a week. Um, so my, my answer is it, it's complicated. Uh, there's lots of ways we can, we can attack this. Um, I started looking specifically at invasive species down in Venice, for example. Um, and I was looking a lot at the species that were brought by boat uh, from China and Japan into the lagoon where they were taking over uh, the native uh, species of seaweed. Um, and this is, a, I guess, a good example of using drawing again as a mapping tool, but in this case, mapping different places of seaweed and where I saw them in the lagoon. And one of the things that I noticed is that depending on the amount of light or nutrient flow through the canals, different types of seaweeds were present. Um, and I think it's really interesting to think of boats as ecosystems, boats as traveling these species. Um, I saw some of the invasive species literally attached to them and growing, um, but also seeing the way that seaweed interacts with architecture. Um, here, the, the seaweed actually becomes a line and a mapping of the different tide levels on the steppes of Venice. So always, always noticing these different relationships between how our built world interacts with our natural world. Um, and for uh, the Venice Biennial, I ended up constructing a uh, stool out of uh, leather that I made out of the kelp. Um, so this was one of the material solutions that I proposed for this very site-specific uh, yeah, project. Um, and basically tanning it only with uh, vegetable alternatives, which is an interesting process. Um, the other application that algae can have historically in construction, not like weird bio design, like turning it into leather, um, is actually uh, looking at it as a source of glue for plasters. And this is something that was commonly done in Japan, um, especially for lime plasters or for clay plasters. Uh, you used a glue from red algae, which uh, helped improve the uh, the workability of the plaster mix. So it kept it wetter for a longer period of time. Um, and this was called uh, many times, uh, the clay plaster is called moritsuchi, which means glue plaster. And here actually I almost made a translation error. Um, I heard noritsuchi and I thought, ah, yeah, nori, I know what that is. And I almost confused the species of seaweed that was used, thinking that it was nori as an edible seaweed instead of nori as in glue. Um, and the, the glue seaweed that was used was actually a form of seaweed that was not prized for being super tasty and super edible. It's only used in one regional dish in the south of Japan. Um, and this is an important distinction to make. Countries that have long-term relationships with seaweed would sometimes, like Japan, mark certain species for consumption, and those species were prized for consumption. And other species were marked as less delicious and more functional and used for craft applications. Um, so it's always important to be aware of this context. Sometimes my work with kelp in Japan uh, kind of horrifies people because it, it's like akin to playing with your food and, and you're taking something that's supposed to be eaten um, and then messing around with it. Um, Whereas in the Venice project, a lot of the kelp that I was using, even though it is wakame, which is edible kelp, it's polluted by the pollution in the canal, so you can't eat it. So in that case, I think that that is an appropriate application for using it, but um, using edible kelp to create work um, in some ways might be, you know, seen as a bad thing in a Japanese context because it is playing with 
food, essentially, and something that has a function as a food and should be respected as a food. So that is an important side note. So I actually started experimenting based off of this, trying to see, can I create a version of noritsuchi here in the Netherlands, uh, but using a local um, species of the same genus um, as the glue source as well. And the same, uh, I, used, I was using Irish moss, the same uh, red algae was actually used as a glue base in Denmark as a source of paint uh, for using um, on ceilings. And the red algae created a paint basically that was so thick that when you tried to paint your ceilings with it, it wouldn't drip down. So that was the big benefit of using algae in the glue um, as opposed to perhaps bone glues or other glues which are more commonly used in facade paints here in Denmark. So for my thesis at TU Delft, um, I ended up experimenting with lots of different seaweed-based uh, materials, bioplastics, paints, um, composites, um, also with shells, and compiling all these applications in my thesis presentation and also exploring it materially through design. One of the applications I developed were different types of constructions using these materials. Um, I came up with a timber frame application using seagrass as insulation infill, and also using the clay plaster on top, as well as a masonry application where I used shells as load-bearing bricks, uh, algae in combination with clay uh, to create limestone, which are on the leftmost side. And this was research I did with another TU Delft student named Brian Reinders. Um, her, her thesis is also public, so you can also find it online. Um, in the second center, we have uh, insulating uh, seagrass blocks. Um, so all of these are just testing different things, different ways to use seagrass and seaweed in construction. Um, and uh, yeah, trying to propose different construction applications for them. And one of the things I also did was experiment with drawing and creating essentially a lab book, but through my own way, creating a seaweed lab book. Um, and this was my book that basically served as kind of my, all my experimentation for my thesis, but also um, sketching different ideas and journaling different species as I came across them. Um, and I would like to point out that in many places you cannot collect algae. Um, so a lot of times I worked with seaweed farmers to collect the algae for me. Um, or people who have a permit to collect algae and they gave me specimens. And so a lot of times when you see specimens in my sketchbook or used in my applications, those are actually farmed um, and not collected raw by me. Um, and the reason for that is because if you're collecting out in the wild, you can actually damage the ecosystem. Uh, so I do not endorse just going out and grabbing a bunch of seaweed off of a rock and then using it. Um, I do actually endorse, you know, talking to professionals and working with them to get raw materials. So I started trying to bring this materiality into architecture, into my design, and, you know, I had created all these different materials. Can I actually bring this into model making? Um, I ended up using the bioplastic as well to create uh, different lamps and um, also selling these through my practice to help fund my research. Oh, and all the different colors of the lamps come from natural materials, um, different natural algae species and microalgae species as well. And then finally, the uh, last thing that kind of evolved out of this was using the paint and, uh, you know, this as well in my drawings, but also in printmaking, um, printing uh, on the bioplastic with the seaweed and microalgae paint and uh, learning how to uh, apply this through, uh, through screen printing which was something I hadn't done before. And now it's starting to express itself graphically through my practice where I'm mixing lots of different uh, natural paint samples from different microalgae colors and seaweed base paints and uh, apply that through printmaking. So the second to last project I'm gonna talk about has to do a lot with shells, which I touched on briefly for my TU Delft thesis, um, but looking at shells as a concrete uh, composite. Um, so typically, historically, we would use shells for quick lime, uh, and we would heat up the shells to 800 degrees Celsius. This would form quick lime, and then you would slake the quick lime, quick lime by adding water to it. Um, and then over time, as the quick lime, well, the lime uh, is exposed to air and carbon dioxide, it hardens back into limestone. And this process is known as the, the lime cycle. Um, the process in itself of 
becoming a uh, slate lime and then turning into uh, back into calcium carbonate uh, is, I believe, 90% effective, whereas with traditional uh, Portland cement, it's only about 30% effective at uh, reabsorbing carbon dioxide. Um, in addition to that, uh, you ha also have to heat limestone up to 400, sorry, 1450 degrees Celsius, as opposed to 800 degrees Celsius for shells. So this process of using quick, quick lime and shells as lime um, is actually a much more sustainable process of using it as a concrete than uh, Portland cement, which is what, what we use today actually. Um, but the benefit of Portland cement that many people use it for is the fact that it sets hydraulically. So it sets with water as opposed to relying on air exposure to set like lime does. Um, the problem also with concrete is that relies on sand, which is at this point in the industry running out. Um, we're relying on sand actually that is technically illegally mined from riverbeds in India and stolen from entire communities. So we don't ask where it comes from, we just pick it up at our building markets and we use it in buildings. But we all in the industry know, and this is our big dirty secret, is that the sand is coming from irresponsible sources because there just isn't enough of it for concrete production. Here in uh, Denmark, um, concrete is actually used mainly now for stone reefs. Uh, they're trying to bring back and improve biodiversity here. And one of the things that marine biologists are just relying on is concrete, which we thought was pretty stupid to be perfectly honest, because not only is it damaging to the environment to rely on concrete for biodiversity, you know, the very environment we're trying to protect. The reason why marine biologists are using it is because it's easy and convenient and can be cast um, pretty, pretty effectively. So we thought, okay, there has to be a better solution than this. So I started building off of some of the applications I had made for my TU Delft thesis and thinking, okay, is there a way that we can make this with very low heat, much more sustainably, um, you know, we got, I started working with a marine biologist named uh, Dr. Shannon Hansen, uh, got into a lab recently, and we are basically redeveloping it from the ground up to come up with our own reef design, uh, which we hope to deploy through our project called Reef Circular, hopefully in the coming year. And we want to use this from shell waste, um, very low heat, um, and encourage marine biologists to use this as an option to improve biodiversity instead of relying on concrete. So this is where we're headed with this project. And then the last thing that I'm working with through my studio is a design build company called The Living House here in Denmark that combines Japanese uh, craft and Danish tradition um, in buildings and new houses. So we're working on trying to get some of the natural construction uh, research and materials that I've developed over the time into actual built projects. So that is currently what we're working on. We have a couple of really cool built projects coming up um, where we're hoping to integrate some of this old craftsman knowledge and some of the new biodesign thinking. Um, and we're really excited to see where we can go with it. And the last thing I'd like to leave off with is that um, you know, this, a lot of this is a focus on my practice, but really architecture and design is teamwork. Um, it relies on being able to collaborate and communicate with many different dif disciplines and many different backgrounds. Um, so it's really in your best benefit as a future architect to step outside of your comfort zone, talk to as many people as you see and learn from the world around you and the people in different disciplines. Because the more you can interact with different people, the more you realize that you have something to offer and they have something to offer you. And that's what essentially leads to innovation. So yeah, I'm happy to take any questions as, uh, as needs be. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was fantastic. I especially appreciated your meandering path to architecture. <laughs> it's something we asked our students to uh, look at for themselves. So that was very helpful. I'm going to ask people in the hall who have been watching you for their questions first. And in the meantime, people on Zoom, if there's a question, add it to the chat. Or they could just put up their hand and they could ask it or me. Also true. Good point, sir. Okay. Anybody here have a question? Uh, Luke, and then come on forward. So, thank you. Yes, hi, my name is Luke. Um, 
Very interesting work. I had a question in regards to the medical aspect on using uh, biological material uh, because um, things in nature do uh, eventually die. And there is sort of like that attraction of biodiversity around its existence. So does it cause any allergies or does it cause, or is it a neutral material or organic material? Um, that's a good question. Right now, seagrass is being used in a massive uh, pilot project for a school here in Denmark where um, they're using it to uh, filter the air, actually. They're using it in an air filter. So I asked the same question to the people who are doing this. I said, aren't, aren't you worried about any particulate matter from the seagrass entering in the air? Because I know from experience that if it does break up, it does get very dusty. Um, and they said that they had tested it and know that it, it wasn't causing any problems and it was working pretty effectively as an air filter. Um, the other thing I can say is that um, I think it really depends on the natural material. Um, for example, clay, it's, it's not, you know, it's not dead matter, but it's really very good at regulating humidity in air, uh, which in itself also prevents um, ozone and VOCs from being off-gassed in rooms. So a lot of times clay is actually used to improve indoor air climate in, in buildings. Um, so I think it really, it's really about using the right materials and the right layers um, when it comes to construction to, uh, to make sure that you're you know, creating a healthy indoor air climate for people and not poisoning people, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, uh, I have a question. Uh, I don't know the name in English, so I found it, it's Salgasa Malgay. Mm -hmm. I don't know, okay. I was wondering if uh, this is something that you could use or is there any study on this right now? Because this is a main problem in South America and the Caribbean and there is no use of it right now. Yeah. So, And I think there is a lot of them that we can be used. So I wanted to know if there is something about it. Yes. Um, for my thesis, I actually use sargassum from uh, St. Martin, which is a Dutch... Uh, Yes. Uh, Caribbean colony. Um, and I was given this by climate cleanup, um, a bunch of sargassum. I ended up using it in combination with clay and construction uh, because the clay sucks the excess moisture out of the sargassum and essentially encapsulates it. So I was able to use the sargassum as fiber and clay plaster. And then there's also a couple of studies that show algae being used as fiber in cob construction. And I think that these are two very, you know, I guess you could say uh, lower tech ways of integrating the sargassum and using it um, as a building material. Um, that being said, I think one of the things that could be even more accessible to using large amounts of sargassum is to use it as fertilizer. Um, you can also, yeah, use it as cattle feed. Uh, but of course, this always depends on where the sargassum has been grown. Has it been grown in an area where there's a lot of pollutants because it also will absorb heavy metals in the water where it's growing. Yes, that's true. Okay. Um, so there's lots of different factors to using it. Um, my grandmother actually comes from Vieques in Puerto Rico. So I really, try, I've tried to pitch several times unsuccessfully uh, going down there and doing something with the sargassum and have not been able to get funding so far. But um, I'm working with a local architect down there and we're trying to you know, get some money going right. so we can actually integrate it and see some projects um, and hopefully benefit the community down there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming forward. One sec, we have a question from the chat. Steve Fallon mm -hmm. wondered, does the 90% efficiency with using shells versus the 30% efficiency of Portland cement translate directly to decreased CO2 emissions? That was one. And then is the strength compatible, comparable? Um, yes. So the life cycle itself happens like when the chemical reaction happens with the material. So over time, the um, shells absorb, the shell mixture, the quick lime mixture absorbs 90% of the emissions back essentially. Um, whereas Portland cement will only reabsorb 30% of those emissions back. Uh, so yeah, that's less, but also too, um, you have to remember that it takes a lot of energy to heat up these materials to break it down into cement. Um, and it takes less energy to heat up the shells than it does 
to heat up limestone and clinker to create Portland cement. So overall using shells is actually way more sustainable than using Portland cement. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's uh, still, still there is, you know, it's not a hundred percent sustainable. Some people will say lime is, you know, always a better alternative. It's super sustainable. And they start to say stuff like carbon neutral. And it's like, okay, the chemical reaction itself might be somewhat like towards carbon neutral, but you still have to heat that up to produce the lime. So that process in itself is not carbon neutral. It's important to consider the whole process when you're thinking about carbon emissions. Right. And then um, for when it comes to tabby concrete, which is the concrete that's used in the South for uh, actually for a lot of old, these very old Spanish forts like St. Augustine and stuff. Um, yeah, the compressive strength is comparable. I was able to do a preliminary test on my shell crate, which was actually made with um, glue binders like seaweed glue and bone glue uh, for two Delft. And it performed pretty similarly to concrete, which is crazy. But that was just a very baseline, like, you know, at uh, a um, technical college where they did the tests for me. So it's very informal. More testing definitely needs to be done. But I think it's, uh, it's proof that there is potential in it. That's great. And to follow up on that one, uh, Jabril asked, do you think it's viable to replace all of Portland cement? for con concrete construction in the world with shell-based lime? Um, I think we actually need to rethink concrete and construction a lot of the time. Um, for example, with uh, the living house as the platform, one, one of the things that we're doing is if the ground is able to take it, we use screw foundations instead of concrete for the bases. And it's led to actually a bunch of problems with trying to get insurance for the houses, even though screw foundations have been used for hundreds of years, because people are like, whoa, I, I, don't, I don't know about this screw foundation stuff. I, I prefer to pour my, my foundations. But um, in some cases too, it's also, we can't necessarily avoid using concrete in the foundation because of the water ta uh, table levels. So we might need like a 20 meter screw or we might need a pour foundation. So it really is a case by case uh, situation. And I think when it comes to, uh, yeah, to using concrete, we just have to rethink it. And in areas where it perhaps it's more, makes more sense, we can use shell con based concretes instead, um, especially around the coastal cities where there's a lot of shell waste. Um, we found that one restaurant produces over 20 kilograms of oyster shell waste just in one service here in Copenhagen, um, which is insane if you think about it. So. Catherine, we had another question in the room. I asked the student to come forward, here, please. Uh, first of all, I do want to say that thank you so, so much for this lecture. I think it's very interesting in how looking at um, how different sources we didn't think that would be helpful are actually being used and not wasted. Um, but I was kind of curious on how long does seagrass and seaweed um, like insulation or structures last and how often does it need to be replaced or like taking care and how it performs, especially with certain climates. Um, and if it if it means that one has to preserve or um, it has to be taken care of in certain ways using preservatives or um, additional chemicals, do those chemicals harm uh, the people or are there, um, is there a certain level of danger or um, unsafetiness associated with that preservative? And, you know, is it used for that's long good. or short-term projects? <laughs> I know, sorry. There was a that's a, yeah, I mean, that's a super I in-depth question. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's, it's also, it's a, it's a very wise question. Uh, for example, like a lot of the bioplastics and stuff that I'm experimenting with, that's really, you know, that's very experimental design stuff. That's not stuff I necessarily advocate. Some people look at that and like, oh, can you make windows out of this? And I'm like, no, you should not make windows out of this. Um, windows need to be, you know, thermally, have the right thermal uh, coefficient to be used in construction, especially here in Denmark. And uh, a little piece of seaweed plastic is not even going to remotely reply, like, create that compared to glass with a couple of air uh, layers of air in between it. Um, so um, whenever I propose a construction, I try to do it building off of what is already existing. So that is why too, I paired algae in some cases with clay, uh, because we have a long tradition of using clay in construction and using clay in combination with fibers. Um, so a lot of the applications that I'm proposing are actually building off of these very old natural construction techniques, rather than trying to come up with something completely new and completely out of there. 
because the reason why these old techniques exist is because they've actually been tested through trial and error over hundreds of years by craftspeople. Um, so I'm not trying to necessarily reinvent the wheel with some of my applications. There are scientists out there that are trying to do stuff like create um, spray foam insulation with seaweed using the nanocellulose extracted from seaweed. And that's where I'm like, okay, we really got to test this because it's one thing to do it in the lab and say, haha, it works. It's another thing to test it entirely in a building cavity over time with different types of construction, whether it be masonry or timber and seeing, okay, how does this actually perform? Um, so, you know, we were, we, some of this knowledge we actually already have through craftspeople uh, through the years. So I always say they have knowledge in their hands. It's just not necessarily written about academically. And then with the seagrass roofs, um, on they last uh, 200 to 300 years before needing to be switched. One of the interesting things is that they relied heavily on seagrass because they deforested their island for salt production. And because of the amount of salt in the air, it prevented certain plants from growing in the roofs on the island. Um, and the plants, the amount of plants that look beautiful on the roofs, but if they die in the roof, that's what actually can start to cause rot in the roof. Um, so on uh, the main island of Copenhagen, there's a couple of seagrass roofs that are in Freelands Museum in, in the open air museum here in Copenhagen area. And the plants that grow on those roofs are different from the plants that grow on Leicester. And then there's also more plants. Um, so you have to like be very careful with your maintenance and remove dead plants as you notice them. But if it becomes too much, it'll, it'll increase the rot. Um, when it comes to using it in timber frame construction, um, again, it can last hundreds of years. Um, as long as you're creating a breathable construction with the right layers again. Um, and in Denmark, we know how to do that. We have like the right, we have a windbreaker board, we have a timber frame construction. And we don't actually use any damp proof membranes um, in this country when it comes to breathable construction. We create what's called a diffusions open construction, uh, which allows the moisture to pass through one side of the construction to the other side. Um, and it, as long as you set that up right, it should last um, in theory, <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious if you shared with us what you're doing next, what if you would try to imagine the next five years, would you like to be doing with your studio? And your um, studio? Yeah, it's a good question. I think in the next five years, I would really like to make some of this stuff like rolled out in actual built projects, which I'm already working on, but I'd also like to, to explore it in all forms uh, from interior to, you know, exterior, just, you know, really exploring the aesthetics of some of these materials and the materiality um, through my studio. And um, I think that's kind of my end goal is to, to really embrace it in all forms, which is something that uh, sometimes people are like, I don't really get it. Is it really architecture? And I'm like, yes, it's all architecture. <laughs> And would you like to teach people like workshops about how to cure seaweed and seagrass so that uh, for their separate uses? Yeah, well, we're actually gonna teach like a, probably a big bioplastics workshop here in Copenhagen. I have a collaborator from Poland and I've already told her, I was like, we need to get you over here and you can stay at my apartment and we'll throw a big casting party for some students from the Royal Academy and teach this. And it's more fun, you know, when you do it in a big group. Um, then, you know, yeah, by yourselves. So I, I would also love with te to teach workshops and then I'm already teaching um, as a guest critic and a guest lecturer for DIS in Copenhagen, which is the Danish Institute of Study Abroad. Uh, mm -hmm. So American students that come and study in Denmark, they get to take credits uh, through architecture at DIS. And um, I actually spend a lot of time explaining to Danish teachers, like the American system, like, okay, you know, American culture is like this. I know, I know like Danish culture is like this, but like, you gotta imagine these students are, you know, coming from this background and stuff and they're like, oh, whoa. <laughs> so a lot of cross-cultural communication ends up happening, which is really great. And I don't know if you see Jabril's latest great question, are there resources online or print that you use to follow the latest in architectural material development? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think I a lot, one website I end up uh, recommending to everyone is Materium, which is like an online archive of uh, open source biomaterial recipes. Um, and a lot of people end up using them in stuff like an interior design or uh, industrial design or in fashion applications. But for students that are looking to tinker around and stuff, I always recommend looking at that website. 
And then um, I'll, I, I'll, to be perfectly honest, I spent a lot of time talking to old craftspeople and just, you know, talking with them and using my language skills to like, you know, understand more about some of these traditions and cultures. And that ends up actually uh, influencing my work a lot more. Um, so I'm, I'm always really interested in that. And sometimes I just kind of like fall down these weird rabbit holes because of it. Um, so yeah, talk to craftspeople. They know a lot. <laughs> That's my advice. All right, other questions in the room? About glass and sand. Gushan, come come up. What was that? There's a question about glass and sand. Oh, I don't know if you know about this, Catherine, but there are people who are in the chat concerned about the lack of sand and uh, wondering if we ground up all the glass. Would yeah, I think you, you can use um, ground up shells as a sand replacement. Um, as, as long as it's fine enough, you can start to use it as a sand replacement. But um, yeah, I think we need to start experimenting with different forms of concrete because, uh, yeah, we are we are running out, and desert sand is not uh, is not good for for concrete production. So even there's a lot of desert sand. That's why a lot of people are experimenting with different forms of cement and trying to see what can happen if we explore different forms of cement because I think that's really the the, the uh, yeah the killer for not using other forms of sand is is the type of cement. Um, so. Yeah, I think it, we have to completely rethink concrete if we want to use other forms of sand. Um, but yeah, recycled glass, grinding that up, trying to use that as a replacement for sand is a good idea. So is using shell dust. Um, and it can also hopefully offset the amount of cement that you need as well. 